for a victim's rep, a defence practitioner, a probation rep, and an academic. And so they meet 10 times a year to discuss the work of the council, the production of sentencing guidelines, and generally everything we do. But behind the scenes, supported, um, supporting the sentencing council are, 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 are people like and me and Caroline and Pamela who are here today, um, members of the office of the sentencing council. So we are civil servants and we uh, are policy and legal officials, researchers, physicians, and communication specialists. Um, and so we do a lot of sort of behind the scenes stuff for supporting the, the work of the guidelines. So the main thing we probably know us for is for developing sentencing guidelines for use in all courts in England and Wales. And these are guidelines that are used by judges and magistrates every time they sentence an offender. Uh, they are sort of documents that you go through and they tell you to consider the, uh, the culpability of the offender in committing the offence, the harm caused by the offence. Um, it gives sentencing starting points and ranges for the, that you should be considering when sentencing and any aggravating or mitigating factors that might adjust the sentence that you're coming to. Um, and then information on guilty pleas, totality and things like that. So they have a, a, a lot of scope to sort of change sentencing practice. Um, we also assess the impact of guidelines, assess the impact that we think they will have and then look back at the impact that they've actually had. And we promote awareness amongst the public of all things related to sentencing. So, as I said, the guidelines that we produce have the potential to have quite a large effect, and we have a statutory responsibility to produce resource assessments that consider the likely impact of our guidelines, guidelines on prison, probation, and youth justice services. So, generally, when producing a guideline, the council intends to maintain average sentencing severity. So, they're not necessarily looking to push sentences on average up or down. They want to maintain average sentencing severity, but just make sentencing sort of more consistent and transparent to the public. Um, sometimes they intend to change sentencing practice. They might want to push sentences up for a particular offence if they think that's right or, or bring them down. Uh, and sometimes our resource assessments are looking at impacts that might happen that we can see by might cause, uh, which is not necessarily intentional, but if they're not interpreted as we intend, they may cause this sort of an impact. So every time we publish a guideline, we publish a resource assessment as the impact that we think that that guideline is going to have. And this sort of acts as a, as a kind of tool for us when it comes to the evaluations and, the, and evaluating the guidelines because we're able to compare what's actually happened with what we thought would happen. So once a guideline has been in place for a while, we evaluate them, evaluate the guidelines. Uh, and this usually involves a, a bunch of different things. So we look at trend analysis, so we think look at things like the number of offenders sentenced to the offences covered by a guideline, the different sentencing disposals that are proposed at court, uh, average custodial sentence length and that kind of thing. We also look at conducting research with sentences sometimes, which is more of a sort of implementation evaluation where we're looking at are the guidelines being interpreted as we intended and are judges and magistrates having any issues with understanding more how they should be using them. Uh, we also analyse transcripts of judges' sentencing remarks. So when a judge at a crime court reads out their sentence, that sentence is recorded um, on audio and we pay to get those transcribed and we analyse those transcripts to understand the sorts of factors that they're taking into account when sentencing. Um, and that can be quite a useful tool in understanding how sentencing has changed when we compare sentencing practice before a guideline is enforced with sentencing practice afterwards. And we also conduct data collect exercises to collect information on factors taken into account. So usually this involves asking sentencers to complete a form every time they sentence an offender for particular sentence of offences and then telling us the culpability and harm factors, the, the starting point, the sentence they impose, the guilty plea reduction, and a lot of the other things that we cover in our guidelines. So again, that's like another useful tool. But together, this can be quite a lot of information. And sometimes it's useful to just have one measure that we can look at to look at how is sentencing on average changed over time? And this is where severity scale comes in. So a few years ago, a severity scale was developed in, internally within the office of the Sentencing Council. Um, and this is a scale, a numerical scale from 0 to 100, and it sort of maps all sentencing outcomes onto, onto the scale. So from a discharge at zero on the scale to 20 years at 100. And then we can calculate an average and look at how that average changes over time. This means that instead of having to just look at the use of different disposals and separately looking at average custodial sentences and average fines, we can look at it all in one go. Um, 
So we conduct things like trend analysis and also time series analysis. So I'll show you a couple of quick examples, not with masses of context, but just to give you a flavor of kind of how we scale. Um, and then that'll give you a bit more of an idea of, of why uh, Jose scale will be useful. So this is an example of average annual severity from our drug offenses plan evaluation. Uh, the guideline came into force in February 2012, and this is looking at importation of a class A drug. So the Sentencing Council for importation of a class A drug wanted sentencing severity to decrease for a particular type of offender that we refer to sometimes as drug mills. So offenders who've been exploited or particularly vulnerable. And when they were looking at sentencing practice, when developing the guideline, they felt that sentences were maybe too high for, for the offences they were committing, considering that they've been exploited and wanted to reduce sentences. And following the introduction of the guideline, we found that sentences did reduce for these offenders. And you can see by looking at average severity on this chart that when the guideline came into force, average severity went down. Then looking um, also at average severity, but this time monthly for non-domestic theory, Average severity here is represented by the red line and the blue horizontal lines are a confidence interval of where we would expect sentencing severity to fall in absence of a guideline if we hadn't implemented anything that would have changed severity. So we didn't anticipate there would be a change in severity for non-domestic burglary, but um, the, the dashed line, uh, the dashed vertical line is when the riots happened in uh, 2011 and the, the thicker black line is when the guideline came into force. And what we found was that sentencing severity increased above what we would have expected um, after the guideline came into force. So I won't go into the details of the reasons why we think that happened, but um, the evaluation is published and I'm happy to answer any questions later on if you have any. Um, and then another example from our recently published sexual offences evaluation. This chart shows sexual assaults and again this is time series analysis so we're looking at the red line being average sentencing severity in each month over time. The black line is when the guideline came into force and the purple bands around it are the forecasted confidence interval. And again, we found in this example that average severity went above what we would have expected because we didn't anticipate any changes in sentencing practice for this offence. So again, without any context for sort of why we think this happened, it has been a useful for us to be able to kind of bring all different sentencing outcomes together into one measure. And this will never tell us everything because whenever we look at something like this, we're not able to understand what drove this. And that's when we look at all of that other information. We do research sentences to find out if it was uh, a, an interpretation issue, if it was the levels of sickness or factors that caused it, um, or we might be able to use transcripts or data collection data. So this won't tell us why, but it's kind of usually seen as our initial look into like, what happened when the guideline came into force. So, as I said, the, the severity scale was developed in-house and it's been a really useful tool for us and it's usually the first, one of the first things we do at least in each of our evaluations. But the methodology wasn't published and while I don't think we thought that that was necessarily important at the time, it's become apparent over the last couple of years that it would be, it would be a good idea to be more transparent about how it's developed and we often have questions about how it was developed and, and what it takes into it. And although we do sort of understand it, we weren't the people to develop it ourselves. So it would be useful to have a methodology that we understand and that is out there in the public domain that we can kind of back up and that people can refer to as needed. It also didn't take into account sentences and experts' views in, in the development of it. I mean, it did a little bit, but not very much. And, and sentences are really the ones who will be able to have a better view of kind of the relative um, differences in severity of, of different sentences. So um, we have been working with uh, Dr. Jose Pim Sanchez over the last year to uh, develop a new severity scale that will be published and will be more transparent, but it's also more robust, takes into account sentences views, and hopefully we'll be able to use that in our future guideline evaluations, and potentially also it might be useful for use in analysis within the MOJ. So I'll pass over to Jose. Sorry. Actually, yeah, talk about Yeah. So let me open my part. Yeah. So thanks a lot, Andrew, for that, and um, and thank you, Gabriel, for organizing this, and, and everyone for being here. I mean, I'm still a little bit shocked that all of you are here, you know, so late in the day. You know, for us, you know, the university place. I mean, we really plan, you know, we try to avoid any kind of place <laughs> after four, really, because we, you know, we wouldn't see anyone coming up. Thanks. You know, thanks very much for that. Um, so what I'm going to do is basically elaborate um, on how we've done, you know, how we've uh, estimated in this kind of survey that um, Amber was talking about. 
to go a little bit more far, you know, a little bit far into technical details. Um, um, but but before doing that, you know, I want to, and this is such a cliche, really, and I hate when people do this in talks because it's so boring. But I, I really want to start by thanking, you know, I really want to start by thanking everyone that has helped uh, along uh, along the way, because this project has been a real roller coaster. You know, there were so many times where you know it was very close to fail, and if it hadn't been for the people around us, you know, we wouldn't have succeeded. So. First of all, you know, I'd like to thank you know, like Robin Linacker, who I think is a colleague of yours, right? And yes, a data scientist here. So it was, I mean, all we're doing is following his steps, really. He traced uh, the route, and we're just following, you know, using different methods, but basically, you know, the insight was not came from him. And that's the scale that uh, Amber was referring about. And I talked to him, apparently, you know, he couldn't make it because he's on paternity leave, right? Yes, yeah, sure. All right, so yeah, congratulations yeah, yeah, yeah. to him. You know, I am, um, he's looking at the top of sorority. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Yeah, no, well, good luck with that. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, um, so thanks for that. Of course, you know, thank you to the National Center for Research Methods uh, who funded the project. And, and of course, you know, thanks to the Sentencing Council who endorsed the project, we, we helped which, you know, we couldn't have had funding. Um, particularly, you know, there's been so many people within the Sentencing Council, but clearly I'm very, you know, without you, you know, we, we, we will have failed, you know, uh, clearly I'm, but also, you know, Jean Brannan, who is a member of the Sentencing Council, she opened the doors to us when, when we didn't get access to judges and sentences. She opened the doors to the magistration to us so we could actually contact them. And that was, you know, that was one of the moments where, you know, everything was going to fall apart. Uh, but beyond that, you know, we actually used uh, explicitation workshops and for that, you know, different policy people in the Sentencing Council has helped, like Ruth Pope or Eleanor. Um, and of course, you know, thanks to my two co-investigators. So these are, you know, more quantitative criminologists so or criminologists with a background in quantitative methods. But you know, these two are the real hardcore based on statisticians behind the project. And again, without them, you know, you have the whole thing would have crashed. So uh, okay, I did that. Get it out of my system. And now I'm gonna get. Uh, I'm gonna. I want to start by taking a step back and saying you know, why does this matter? You know, why are we doing this? And and to, and to show how important it is what we're doing, um, it's actually to consider how useful it is, you know, to analyze census data. Um, we can answer, you know, like limitless and you know, endless number of research questions just by actually cracking that data, right? And playing with that data. Um, so clearly, you know, like Amber was talking about how we can use it to monitor severity, to have a look at, you know, what kind of impact sentencing guidelines have got. But you know, that's just one of the many applications. Really, we can go a lot farther than that. So, you know, psychologists like to use, you know, analyze sentence data to look at the different heuristics or biases, you know, in human decision making, uh, because that's what it is at the end of the day, you know, it's a human decision making process. So, penal theorists or criminologists like to have a look at what kind of aggravation mitigating factors have been used as a way, you know, to understand, you know, how punitive the system is or, you know, how retributive or utilitarian. Um, then, of course, we can look, if we know that, you know, if we know we can, which kind of factors have been used, uh, are been used. We can comply with sentencing guidelines. So, you know, plenty of academic and policy relevant questions, but we can even go further than that. Um, we can get into more elusive terrain, but, you know, arguably even more important and look into, you know, like these constructs that are supposed to be driving, you know, um, sentencing. So we can look at discrimination in sentencing and consistency in sentencing. We can look at the principle of individualization, which hasn't been looked too much. Everyone take it, takes it for granted, or, you know, there's uh, lots of discussions whether the guidelines, you know, are promoting that or, you know, Entering that, that principle, and no one is really looking into that uh, using data. So, if you ask any sentencer, they will tell you, of course, every case is different, right? Every case is a different case, but then if you look at the data, you see that pretty much all sentences are clustered within the different outcomes. So, when that's you know the principle of individualization lies there, we can actually inquire that just by looking at data, right? And we can go on and on, you know, we can look at the issue of proportionality, which gets a little bit more normative, normative um, and perhaps less. Uh, perhaps you know harder to actually operate, but we're working on that at the moment. Uh, we can look at the concept of penal populism, populism um, and I could go on and on. You know, we can actually look at the other side. You know, what happens after the punishment is imposed, and look at you know how effective different punishments are, uh, assessing whether you know the possibilities of the offender reoffending, and you know uh, how effective they are deterring crime. We can look at whether they actually foster compliance and whether you know different punishment help us and promote trust in the criminal justice system, which is one of the main goals, right? I mean, to avoid people taking revenge right in their own hands. And look, we can look at all of those things and more. You know, uh, we could go on. Uh, I'm sure you know you've got plenty of views and for many other things. We can use sentence data for all of this. So it's a massive, it's a massive piece of data. I would say you know, in criminology, it's only second to you know crime. You know, to the figures uh, of crime recorded in the police really. Um, so yeah, a massive, massively important research tool. However, 
um, very much affected by one you know, methodological issue, which is this issue of selection bias, um, which is what we're trying to you know deal with or you know tackle by using this kind of scales already. And the problem, I mean, I think that most of you have worked with sentences. So as soon as you play, start playing with sentences, that you realize that there is this problem, which is that we've got different sentences that are very heterogeneous, um, and each of those or most of them, you know, use a different unit of measurement. So basically, for example, we've got for fines, you know, those are measuring pounds. For custodial sentences, we use days. For community orders, it gets even more complicated, right? Because different conditions are measuring different things. So the point is, how do we put them all? together and, and so we can analyze them, right? There isn't an easy way. So what we tend to do in the literature uh, is two things. So we either focus just on custodial sentences and we do that for technical reasons, you know, um, for convenience, reasons of convenience. And the point is that, you know, that's a continuous variable, easy to be manipulated, right? I mean, and often normally distributed, so we can play with that, and run regression models with that, we tend to yeah, overuse it, really. I myself, I'm guilty for having done that. Um, um, I'm saying that I'm guilty because here's the problem, you know, when we use only custodial sentences and we try to uh, generalize our findings, say that we're looking into discrimination, and we only use samples of custodial sentences, and we try to generalize the whole of the sentence in practice, we are incurring a huge issue of sports and selection bias, right? And why is that? Because custodial sentences are really, you know, like, in the minority, we don't use them that much, but I think it was only 7% of cases uh, processed in England and Wales that received custodial sentences. So it's not just that they're a small chunk of all the sentences in practice, it's also that they are the most strange, right? I mean, the more extreme, you know, type of punishment, right? We only use them for very serious cases. So as such, you know, they are very peculiar, and we use them, you know, suspects and magistrates use them differently, right? And they take different kinds of things into consideration. So whatever, whenever we're using, we're analyzing that kind of data and analyzing the whole of the sentence in practice, we are, you know, we are trouble, I mean, we're creating trouble, right? So there is another alternative in the literature, which is basically rather than, um, Rather than modeling one particular, you know, uh, rather, rather than modeling, you know, sentence length, just focus on one particular probability of receiving one particular you know, disposal type. Um, so we can do that for any disposal type, but most often we do it for procedural sentences. So we model that probability. By doing that, we use all the different sentences, which is great, you know, that eliminates the problem selection bias. But then we've got another problem, which is that we've um, basically we've um, we lost so much information in the process of doing that, right? I mean, in particular, you know, like in, in the data sets that you produce and the sensing that you produce, we can see whether, you know, like we've got a discharge or fine. And now, you know, like Amber is telling me that now we're going to be able to see actually the different levels of fine, the different bands. So there's so much information out there, you know, that we will end up losing by just turning that, all of that information into a zero one variable. Um, so, yes, there is no section bias, but it's pretty bad in terms of, you know, like loss of information. So any analysis that we run on just the probability of custody or not are not going to be very cognitive, and that's a problem. So this is this is nothing new, really. I mean, um, this selection bias in sentence data, you know, was uh, first acknowledged by some American criminologists in the 70s, um, and they've actually suggested some adjustments or some ways to deal with it. Um, the problem, and this is why you know we got interested in the idea. Around this. Uh, the problem is that you know these adjustments that they suggest that you know based on really unrealistic assumptions, and I think that's always the case, but in particular if that's the case in England and Wales. So I'm going to talk about two different, uh, the most common type of adjustments. So one is you know this Heckman selection model, or any kind of two-stage process. So according to this process, what we do basically is we first estimate the probability of a sentence ending up into custody, or in my case, you know receiving a custodial sentence, and then we model the duration. Right? So we do it in two different stages by actually including uh, some of the predictive values in the first model as provided in the second model. So that's how it works. Now, when we're doing that, we're assuming two, you're know, making two very strong assumptions that don't really hold. The first is that the sentencing process uh, can be divided in two different stages. And uh, that's definitely not the case in England and Wales, where we have you know sentencing ranges for different levels of seriousness that can encompass non custodial sentences and custodial sentences and not only custodial sentences, but they tell you exactly the duration of the custodial sentence, so these are continuing there really. More importantly, you know, this kind of method requires what is known as exclusion criteria. So that basically means that we need to have variables that affect uh, the probability of sending someone to custody, but do not affect the duration of the sentence. And I don't know, I've been working on sentences with sentence data for the last five years, I don't think I've ever come across 
because it's such a variable. You know, if, if it influences one thing, it influences the next thing. You know, like if it influences the probability of custody, it's going to influence the duration. Not in the same way, that's true, but you know, there's definitely not going to be, I haven't come across one variable, but that's one thing, not the other. So that's a problem. Uh, there are some other methods. I mean, the second most commonly used method is what is known as sensor models or topic models. These are, in a way, better for the case of England whales because they don't assume that there are two different stages. They assume that it's all on one stage. However, the problem with these kind of methods is, is the kind of like, very strong parametric assumptions that lie behind. Uh, so in particular, these kind of models, they would assume that all the data comes from the same distribution. So normally, you know, the, the way they see it is that we've got sentence length, which might be normal or, you know, like kind of left, right skew normal, like log normal, something like that. And then we might have all these all the different cases that are non custodial cases that are, you know, considered to be. So it's not really that they're considered to be serious, but they're considered to be part of that same normal distribution. It's just that they are left truncated on the left-hand side of the distribution. Now, again, when you look into sentence data, you know, it doesn't really look like that. So that, you know, it's, it's a realistic assumption. Some people have come up, uh, responded to that and said, you know, there are semi-parametric models that we could use for sensor data. I'm very not. I mean, they're not going to be as precise, but fair enough, you know, we can use them. The problem with that and, and also affects the previous uh, adjustment that has been suggested in the literature, it's, it's a problem, you know, in any kind of adjustment that has been carried out in the American literature, is that, okay, we can be flexible. Let's, let's assume that, you know, these assumptions, we, we just violate them and it doesn't matter, right? Sometimes that's the case. Uh, still, you know, they're going to be used in all non crucial cases as zeros, really. So they're going to be throwing away all this information that we've got. And it's, it's not just a bit of information, it's that, you know, like, it seems that every day we are doing better at recording the information, so what we can see from the sentence, and we've got more information that side. So it's, you know, it's, it's just a terrible waste of information. So we move on and said, okay, we don't want to do that. We're going to try something different. And again, you know, being inspired by Robin, um, we started this idea. Um, so we suggested, you know, like, actually dealing with this problem of selection bias by creating our estimate and scale of severity. So if we can do that, if we can run you know, the relative severity of different sentence outcomes, we can use all, all the information within them and we can use all of them. So we actually kill two birds with one standby. We use all the information and, and we remove the issue selection bias. The only thing we could come, um, come across. So that was a bit strange, but we said, okay, we're not, actually we're not inventing anything new. This has been considered before. Uh, and that was actually quite informative. I'm going to talk now about you know, what kind of methods we use. Uh, but as I was saying, you know, we actually picked it up. Uh, I've said, you know, that big gap actually coming came up. Um, so yes, they're doing that, you know, for just practical reasons, as Amber has explained, and we decided to pick it up uh, from them, from there. Now, what is the benefit, as I was saying before, you know, if we manage to do that, you know, we'll be able to use all the, all the different sentences. We remove completely the problem selection bias, we've got bigger samples, and we also use all the information. So it's a win-win-win, really. And all that sounds fantastic, but the real problem is how do we do it? <laughs> is, you know, how do we estimate, you know, this uh, state of severity? Because it's, after all, you know, it's a latent variable that is extremely subjective, so how do we do it? And that's what I want to cover. Um, how am I doing in terms of time? Am I, you know, I've got covered like a fourth of the talk. Am I, are we, I've got 10 minutes? All right. You let me know, you know if I'm boring you or, you know, because it's you know, Let me know, or just speed up and, and that way, um, yeah, that would be very strange. So, a quick uh, review of the literature, the methodological literature that has been used, you know, to estimate sentence severity. Uh, we can actually group all of the different articles into four main groups. And um, here are the four different groups. So the first one is not really a methodology, but it seems what has been used the most often in sentencing commissions in, in the US. Uh, so it's not really a method. It's basically, you know, them saying, them actually ha having the same problem that the people the sentencing council has, which is how do we assess, you know, whether severity has been going up or down on time because they've been, you know, issuing or uh, publishing uh, uh, sentencing guidelines, you know, since the 80s, uh, since the, since the, yeah. So they have the same issues, right? They have to look at the same research questions. And the way they deal with, they dealt with that was to say, okay, let's get a few wise people, a few elders on sentencing and say, okay, we can establish that this charge will be a zero, capital punishment will be a 100. So you tell me, you know, where is one year in prison? And then we say, okay, 10, 15, something like that, they take the average and that's what they use, right? And they, then they use different milestones and that's how they create. So problems with that, you know, all, all of the problems that you want to it, really. I mean, uh, it's unpredictable, you know, it's not scientific, and it seems so arbitrary, really, that we didn't even consider it. Um, there is a better method, 
Um, and this comes from the literature in steam psychology, which is known as magnitude escalation. And this is the main method that has been used in the literature. So the idea for this one is actually, again, you know, you take a sample of people, experts, or you know, people from the general public, depending on what, who you want to target it for. And, and then you give them what is known as a modulus, so a benchmark, you know, particular sentence against which you're going to compare all the other sentences that you're interested in. So for example, let me say, all right, the benchmark is one month in custody. So how much more severe would it be two months in custody than one month? And you know they go and say, okay, twice as severe or two and twice and a half, or you know maybe only half as, as severe. Um, now the problem with this with this method is is that it assumes that everyone has got an equal uh, level of numeracy, um, and we see that you know actually because we were we thought about using this method, so we were piloting that, and we could realize. Clearly, you know that some people were really quick at actually making these kind of comparisons, and mentally some of the people weren't. And in particular, we were trying this with different magistrates who are not particularly good at, at numbers. Um, so, you know, we were seeing, you know, like what, what that creates is a huge degree of variability in the responses. And that's exactly what we see in the literature, in the papers I have published, you know, have been published using this method. So, yes, they what they do is basically they take, you know, the sample mean from all the different responses on how much more severe one thing is than the other. But if you look at the dispersion, and they don't normally talk about this, but if you look at the dispersion of the different values, you know, it's huge to the that makes you wonder how representative is the sample mean, you know, when there's so much dispersion, like how it's extremely unreliable. So that made us, you know, like be a little bit concerned about it and decided, you know, not, not to use it or, you know, try to avoid it as much as possible. We ended up using Algebra, but, you know, it's got, it's got that main flow. So another method that has been used only once in the literature for sentence severity, but used massively when, when it comes to crime seriousness, to actually create a scale of crime seriousness, which is, is a literature that is, I would say, 20 times more prolific than these other ones we've actually been learning from what they've been, they've been doing. Is what is known as pair comparison. So this is a lot more straightforward. It involves comparisons of just two sentences and asking people, you know, which one would you pick as a more severe, right? And if you do that over a big sample, a sample big enough, and then over an, a good number of, of different comparisons, you can actually create a scale, a ranking, a sort of ranking them, um, depending on how often you know they're picked as more severe than other. Now, this is a method or a variation of this. Is the method that we ended up using. However, I'm going to be uh, transparent about this. It's based on, again, you know, very strong assumptions. So in particular, we assume that, you know, every different sentence has got a particular normal distribution of severity and also all the different sentences. You know, all the distributions are the same across the different sentences. So we assume that we know the variance of something that is latent and we don't, don't really have a clue about that. That's just a leap of faith that we're taking there. And we've tried to actually attenuate that problem. So I'll talk about that later. And then, you know, the fourth method is, is more like data driven. So that's great because it avoids any, any subjective um, component to it. And um, so, you know, there are a few that have been using the literature canonical correlation correspondence analysis. So if you're familiar with factor analysis or latent variable estimation, it's, it's very similar to that. So we've got a cross tab with all the different types of crimes ranked by the seriousness. Um, and then on the columns, we've got all the different sentence outcomes. And then the cells are the distribution, like, you know, how do we sentence each different crime? So from that, we can infer a particular latent variable driving that uh, for seriousness and another one for, um, for sentence severity. Now, the problem with these methods are there are two problems. One, one is that they assume um, a big assumption they make is that you know, all is driven by proportionality. So sentences are driven completely on crime seriousness, which is a debatable, but it's definitely a wrong assumption, but maybe you know, it's not so, uh, it's, it's okay to violate. Now, the bigger problem is that you know, what we've seen for people using this method is that often you know, there are some blips in the sense that you know some sentence outcomes, so there are some nonsensical values, for example, longer suspended sentences that have got like shorter or have got lower values of severity than shorter suspended sentences. Um, so that can happen every day. Um, so when we saw that, we were a bit suspicious. I mean, as a statistician, I wouldn't care so much if it's just a belief, you know, like the bigger picture might be okay. But if we want the sentencing council to use that, um, they will be and, and, and to actually gather, you know, some legitimacy and you know get you know idea of approval from the general public, we, you know they couldn't afford to do that really. I mean, so we you know, we discussed that method, we focus on, on that other one. Okay, um, but it's actually a variation um, and that has got to do with our sample size. So rather than asking to compare two different sentences, we ask to compare how often one particular sentence will be more uh, severe than, than the other, than another one that we were comparing. So we use 21 magistrates um, and we use a self-completed questionnaire. So we introduce every different sentence outcome that 
data from the sentencing council and from you guys, um, capture. So that was uh, fines, conditional discharges, absolute discharges, um, community orders, suspended sentences, and custodial sentences, and a few variations without them. But we didn't want to include too many variations because as soon as you start, you know, including the more variables that you include the more comparisons that you will ask. So, you know, at one point it explodes, really. So if you want to uh, prevent participant fatigue, really, we, we have to actually limit the number of comparisons that we could include. So we only include the comparisons where we expected and, and we run a few of the pilot, uh, pilot focus groups to see where, where this could be the case. Where we expected that there would be some kind of overlap in terms of severity. So we focus on those ones. And, and one example could be our community orders, like, for example, some community orders have be really punitive, have plenty of conditions attached, and to the point that you know they might be actually more severe than you know some suspended sentences. And in particular, for some offenders, suspended sentences might be a joke, really, because if, if they don't come with any conditions um, and they don't see you know, any severity behind them, so that could be one example where you know we would expect to see some kind of overlap, right? And those were the questions that we included. So this is how you know the questionnaire reads. So we were saying, how often can this particular sentence and the sex be more punitive than sentence? Sentence why, and we made it more. That's already a quite difficult from, uh, uh, question to answer. But we made it even more complex by saying, consider the heterogeneity in the execution of this of this sentence. Consider all the different you know conditions that can be attached to suspended sentences, and also consider you know the heterogeneity of offenders that go through court. Um, based on that, tell me roughly you know what would be the overlap that you would expect to see. So after we bombarded them with questions like that, I guess we have filled them. You know, not to make them too tight. We were able to create, you know, like a matrix of severity that looks like this. So this is a symmetric matrix. So what we've got is like the same sentence outcomes as as rows, as we've got for columns. And the way to interpret this is basically to say how often the particular, you know, let's look at this for example, how often a fine will be um, considered more severe than an absolute discharge. So in this case, it's a one because that will always be the case. So we didn't ask to compare them, those, but we did ask to compare those in between. Uh, and for example, we could find that you know that fine was found to be 69% of the times more severe than a conditional discharge because sometimes conditional discharge can be uh, can have that punitive bite and, and so on, right? And, and now, based on this information, we can we could now create our scale of severity. We could sort of you know transform these metrics of severity into specific scores for the different sentences, uh, sentence outcomes that we included there. And how we did that was using what is known uh, Thurston Mostler model, and in particular the simplest type, which is type five, um, you know, to create our, scale, our, our severity scores. Now, as I said before, basically what we're doing now to transform that into severity scores is assume that each of those outcomes that I showed you before in the matrix are equally distributed in the sense that in the sense that they are all they all follow a distribution of Severity that is normal and, and it's got the same variance everywhere. The only thing that we change is the mean of that distribution. So how we shift it along, you know, the spectrum of the scale of severity. I think that I can show that more clearly graphically. So this is just a simplification of how it looks like. So these are only two sentences outcomes, so we will include many more, right? For the eleven that we included. And basically what we're saying is we know the properties of these distributions. So standard normal distribution with variance 0.5, and that's the same one. Right? What we don't know is what the mean is, but that is going to be conveyed to us by the magistrate by uh, this by the question on how much of an overlap there was. So in this case, 69% of the time fine would be considered, you know, more uh, severe than conditional discharges. So we know the overlap. Based on the overlap, we can infer, you know, what the mean for those uh, particular, you know, like sentence outcomes are, and those will be the separate scores that we will elicit, you know, that we will estimate. Uh, in case a bit, yeah, not more complicated than that, but you know, I think I'm gonna move on. So based on that, if we do that for all the different uh, sentence outcomes that we included, we can start, you know, getting separate scores for each of those. Um, we actually took a step further, you know, so it was a two-stage process, and what we did was, and this is where we got three levels of um, custodial sentences, three different durations. Based on those three durations, we just took a linear extrapolation and went. Um, beyond, you know, to actually feel all the other custodial sentences. And the reason for that, I mean, one reason is to avoid, you know, asking too much really in the questionnaire, but also because, you know, pretty much it's always going to be the case, right? It will always be the case that the longer the custodial sentence, right? I mean, the, the more severe it will be. So it doesn't make really sense, you know, there is no overlap once you pass a threshold in custodial sentences. Now, we've improved that a little bit. So, um, but I'll, I'll get back to that. 
Um, okay, so uh, maybe before doing that, um, and again, you know, this. What, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it, we can think about how you know like this scale already has improved what we've got at the moment. So if if, if I'm right, you know, I think the scale that Robin designed, he used the sentencing guidelines and their starting point for different levels of seriousness. So that's great because you know some starting points have got non crucial sentences and crucial sentences, but they don't have suspended sentences, right? So you know the scale that you know the sentencing council has at the moment doesn't really differentiate between that. So that's uh, another an extra bit of information that we provided by you know creating this uh, new scale of severity. The other important improvement I think is that now there is more space between custodial sentences and non custodial sentences. So I think in a way you know it's got more like face validity because the other one seems to be too clustered to the point that you know almost. They could be almost equivalent. Um, and the other thing I think is arguably an improvement is that we allow for the fact that you know for you know certain overlaps in the sentences that so really punitive suspended sentences could actually be more severe than uh, very short procedural sentences based on what we hear from judges and magistrates or magistrates in this case. Um, okay. So uh, clearly you know there are lots of assumptions behind it. So we started you know like one sensitive analysis. So one was to actually Change this Thurston model that assumes normal distributions for you know the Bradley Terry model, which is like another one that is very much used in the literature. So that implies changing you know from going from a normal distribution to a logistic distribution. We find you know that there's the budget really that much. It's like using logit or probit. Um, so some people make a big issue out of that, but it's pretty, you get the same sort of course, so very similar. Now we only have 21 uh, magistrates, so we also run a 50-50 sample split. So we calculated the scale with just half of the sample and with the other one and compared them. Again, you know, they came quite similar. And it wasn't just that it wasn't similar, you know, the severity score, but also the values for the different cells were relatively similar. Now it, it matters because I mean those values matter, but you know, the other thing to consider is that much of the information is already being provided. It's not going to change based on who the magistrate was in our sample, because much of the information comes from the fact that we're imposing those distributions, right? I mean, those assumptions, and also from the fact that we are, you know, there are so many cells for which they cannot say anything. I, I cannot remain locked. You know, those cells are not going to change regardless of who, because, you know, that's not in the, in the question, mm -hmm. really. So that is already throwing a lot of information into the scale, which might be, definitely makes it more robust, makes it more, you know, assumption driven, right? I mean, so we need to be transparent about this, and we are now working on how to be even more transparent and improve it. Okay, so we found that, you know, based on those sensitive analysis, we could say that, you know, it was pretty pretty solid, pretty stable. Uh, scale of severity, you know, if we were looking at different correlation coefficients for different ways to estimate the scale of severity, they were always pretty high. Um, as I was saying before, you know, that's because, you know, like most of the cells were already low, I mean, we're, because we were imposing these strong assumptions. I'm, 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 we weren't doing this on purpose. This is how things are done in the literature. It's just that it seems that no one seems to discuss these issues that much. Uh, but as you can see, you know, they're actually you know quite quite significant into what you get in the end. Okay, so that's I think that's the first part of the of the presentation. So now I'm going to talk about two different applications of how we view this. So one is very much to do with what Amber was talking about. We just wanted to replicate what the sentencing council does as a way to illustrate how this could be used. Uh, and the point is basically what Amber was saying. Like if, if you want to look at you know how sentence severity has changed across time, so people like Julian Roberts or Andrew Ashworth or you know really important people in, in criminology and sentencing are working on this. Um, and the way they do it is just by look at all the different custodial and disposals and look at how they change across time. So the issue here is that, and that's perhaps the more transparent way to do it, but you know it's, it's hard. It's really hard to see exactly where you know the trend is going. So you can see some clear trends. For example, these are suspended sentences, which were practically non-existent after 2005, following the Criminal Justice Act, and then you're kind of like, uh, there were two deals, uh, and now they are over 15% used you know, for indicted offenses. We can also see at the same time community orders going down, so we kind of know that. Now for custodial sentences, they stay a little bit like that, they go up, but not so much, fines go down, but it's like, well, where are we going, right? I mean, we don't know, that's the point. Uh, so now, using the severity score, scale of severity, we can aggregate them all. So this solid line, you know, will be showing all offenses, you know, all sorry, all cases sentenced in England and Wales um, by year. And we can see that, you know, actually there's been some steady increase in, in severity, uh, actually by 10% since 1999, which might be too much, too little, depending on where you position yourself. But, you know, there are some important insights to get from here. 
One is that most of the inquiries took place before the guidelines came to force. So that's pretty significant because you know this you know gets so much criticism. Really, I, to every conference I go, you know, there's always someone saying, you know, like we should, uh, you know, they should you should, <laughs> you should I'm not gonna say disappear, but you should do something about it, right? I mean, that, that's what they say, right, all the time. Right? That's the main criticism. But they are missing the point because you know they can see that you know some already has gone up, and everyone, you know, as soon as two things are happening more or less at the same time, you know, you jump into conclusions and one is causing the other, right? I mean, what, the point is that you know most of the increases already took place before that, so that's an important insight. Now, if we look at indirect offenses, now that changes a little bit, uh, more massively. <laughs> um, so now we can see that real increase in severity about about 40% in two decades. So that is shocking. That's something. But I reckon we should be doing something about it, or at least, you know, we should we should be more aware than what we really are at the moment. So, could that be driven by the sentencing guidelines? Okay, so we try to look into that. I mean, that you know, this is research that is already done by the sentencing council in many parts, and they do it better than us, really, because they've got better data. So, they can they can look into the specific type of offenses. What, what we did here was to get those kind of main group of offenses from from your criminal justice quarterly statistics, right? Um, and we plot them across time and we turn them into severity, right? And we also plot you know, the time when the different sentencing guidelines were introduced. I mean, the first thing to say here is that there isn't a perfect match between the offenses covering those guidelines and the offenses covering your data. But, you know, like, this is as close as we could get them, right? In particular, you know, for burglary and theft, you, you've got two different guidelines, burglary and theft. Uh, so things that we can see here, uh, it seems that, you know, yes, severity seems to be for most of them going up after the guidelines come into force. But then there is a question as to, you know, is that driven? Is that really a causal effect of the guidelines, or could it be driven? This is a perfect case. Could it be dri driven by previous trend, right? That was a right motion before the guidelines came into force. So that's a pretty good question, right? We want to ascertain causality. At the same time, you know, is it? We can see some fluctuations in some of them. So is it significant that increase in severity? Um, so we can answer it, that, or explore that. Not not really answer it, but explore it uh, by using time series. So that's what we did here, you know, again, following following the same methodology that the sentencing council is using. Um, we created, you know, some confidence intervals based on the forecasted regions, you know, after, you know, using the data from before and, and then trying to contrast that with your self data um, by, um, by self, um, yeah, sentences. And we could only determine that there were two significant increases for violence against the person and, and theft. Uh, for the rest of them, you know, we couldn't really say for sure, you know, it was the guidelines uh, which caused it. Um, and even here, you know, like violence against, against the person, we are saying that this probably has got something to do with the assault guidelines, but, you know, there's so much more here, right? I mean, there's murder, is it manslaughter, manslaughter as well? Yeah. So clearly, you know, yeah, we have to take this with a pinch of salt. But the, the, the bottom line is that we we don't have evidence, you know, to point at the consistency. Okay, so that's just... Um, just application. And that paper was under review for three months or so and in the British of Criminology. And it seems that we got the comments, it seems that it's going to be accepted. Uh, so one of the reviewers really love it. And the other one, of course, you know, like, not so much, but, you know, they, <laughs> but they only ask us you know, to make a few changes. So I, I anticipate that within the next three months or something will come out. So I'll let you know just in case. Um, but you, you can see it already, right? Uh, so the second um, application, which we think is, is the bigger application, really, and this is what we were going after, um, is actually both. One, determine how much, you know, put, a, put a, an estimate on what is the impact of selection bias. So what happens when we only focus on procedural sentences rather than on the whole thing? How is that going to affect our estimate? And the second goal is can we create a framework using Bayesian statistics so other researchers can replicate what we've done and rather than using just procedural sentence, uh, sentence length, use the whole thing and create uh, models that are realistic and we use all the information that we have available. So that's what we set up to do uh, in this other paper, which will be submitted to the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society, the CBC, hopefully soon. Uh, we had it almost ready since April, but you know, there are always delays with these things. So, you know, like, I, think, I think before the break, definitely. Uh, so for this uh, other paper, this other application, what we did was to take a sample from this uh, fantastic data set. They've got a sentencing council, this Crown Court Sentences Survey. Uh, so we took a sample from 2011 of theft offenses. Um, so everything that was theft in 2011 in the Crown Court Sentences Survey. So it's about 7,000 cases. And I think we kind of like that uh, because there was 64, you know, this is the Crown Court, right? So there were 64% of cases that were sentenced to custody, but there was a big chunk of cases, right, of the that received non custodial sentences, right? So maybe interesting, you know, there's enough uh, of, uh, 
enough of a chunk of the sample in there you know, to actually make us worry about selection bias. So the fine community or the suspended sentences. So what will happen if we focus on just procedural sentences as opposed to the whole thing? So we run two different models to look into that. And um, we use all these, okay, so that's our dependent variable, you know, severity discourse. And all of these are, you know, the different covariates that we include. So some of them are you know, substantively interested into saying, you know, what would be the estimate, like, um, or the specific coefficients, like for age um, and gender of the offender. We also have previous convictions, um, whether they are typically presented. And then we've got all the different types of tests that could be considered. And I think this is absolutely essential, really. I don't see this enough in the literature. Definitely, the, in the American literature, they disregard this completely. Um, so I, I went to the American School of Criminology last a couple of weeks ago, and I, you know, I had one of these academic works with uh, with a couple of guys because they don't they don't care about this. Uh, they only control, they only say you know whether it's a sex uh, sexual sex offense or you know like uh, theft or property offense or, or or offense against the person, and that's all they do. If you don't control about the specific you know for the specific offense, then you know you're not controlling for the seriousness of the offense, and then you should expect uh, problems of omitted relevant environment bias, and and they are there for you. Okay, so we have that. So what we did was to basically, and that was our dependent variable. This is how it's distributed. You know, these are the severity scores after you know once transformed, depending on where they come from, right? I mean, which kind of uh, exposure type they got. So we didn't have the duration of suspended sentences, so we just took an average there. So hopefully that data will be ready one day. Yeah, so we can use it, you know, and, and show the full full muscle, right, of, of our scale of severity. Um, so what we did was first of all we just run a model with. Um, Custodial sentences after being transformed into severity, and then a model with the whole thing. So we use you know extremely simplistic models, like you know linear models. What we did was to transform that uh, again using you know, what is a customary uh, practice in the list, which, which is take a logarithmic transformation of that, and so that basically makes it more normally distributed, and just find an OLS model. Um, okay, so that was our first model. Here we are only including you know custodial sentences as transformed in severity and log transform. And we find what we expect. So the more previous convictions, the more severe the sentence. Um, if you plead guilty, the less severe the sentence, right? I mean, pretty much what we expect to see. Now, what happens when we throw all the information? And we have 64% of the cases were custodial cases. I mean, that's not always going to be the case. Actually, it will be more, most often it will be the other way around, that custodial sentences will be the exception. So once we include custodial sentences, we find some differences. Sorry, we want to include all sentences, we find some differences. So I would like to draw your attention to this particular one. So before we saw that, you know, like if you were a man, you would receive a more severe sentence. Um, I'm not saying that there is discrimination against men, because clearly, you know, we're not controlling for whether you've got, you know, your, the person, the offender has bearing responsibilities, mm -hmm. or whether, you know, like a weapon was used, which is more some sort of things that have got like a gender con uh, yeah, influence. So I'm not saying that there is discrimination. I'm just saying, look at how it changes, right? It's three times bigger, the effects for men, uh, once you actually throw everything in. So that basically says that if there is an increased tariff against men, it's definitely taking place, or it's taking a bigger, it's, it's been more influential when we're considering jumps across different disposal types in the non custodial segment than when we're considering the length of custodial sentences. And what is always, what is even more interesting is that it's not always the case that we see, you know, effects being accentuated. Uh, in some cases, in one particular case, we see, you know, like an attenuating, attenuating bias. So the effects for guilty plea now is, is smaller. Um, so again, you know, we should be careful which talk about reductions in numerical terms, like 33% reduction, but they don't talk about reductions in disposal types, right? I mean, so I can see judges, you know, considering that when you are know, considering guilty pleas more often when they are actually using them for, to reduce sentence length and not so much for you know, jumping jumps into different disposal types. So we would be if we were just talking about this and reporting this as if, as if it was a whole sentence in practice, then you know we will be you know uh, it, it, yeah it will be affected by selection bias and it can be that big really. So the answer is the first research question. Okay. Um, everything all right so far? Mm -hmm. Am I doing okay in terms of time? Yeah, good. Okay, so I'm, I'm almost done. Um, so now let's look at the second research question, and this is where the Bayesian uh, stuff comes into play. So, uh, so we just wanted to demonstrate the effects of selection bias. Now we want to actually create a framework that can to actually uh, use this data in a realistic manner. And in order to do that, we need to acknowledge that 
these severity scores are not, we're using them as data, but they are not really, I mean, they're estimates, right? I mean, we are estimating them based on the information we've got from the judges and this Thurston model. Um, and we didn't have too many judges, right? So we should have a lot of sampling uh, in principle. So what we did actually was um, to use Bayesian statistics to estimate the whole thing together. You know, a measurement error, no, sorry, a measurement model, or, you know, this Thurston model, you know, to estimate severity, and also the outcome model that we were interested, right? The sentencing model. Just to look at, for example, discrimination uh, against men, for example, we, this. we estimated them simultaneously. We estimated them under a Bayesian framework. And we also took all these different cells, right, that we are taking as data, as if they were population means. We are taking them now as sample means. So the way we do that is we say, and this is, this is the nice feature of Bayesian statistics, that we can say, here's the data, that's the likelihood function. These are the responses from the different judges or different magistrates. And here is what we think, you know, like the parameter can be distributed. So in this case, we said we don't know anything, so we use a beta, beta distribution. Uh, it's called diffuse or an informative beta distribution. So we said we don't know anything, but you know, take into consideration that this is a parameter. By combining that distribution plus the likelihood function, we can actually obtain, you know, specific estimates with the uncertainty associated to them. And we can propagate that to everything we do, coming through and estimates in our final model. Um, but we actually took it a step further because we said, okay, it's not just sampling error. It's also the fact that you know some of these, some of these sentence outcomes are very heterogeneous. So we're taking community or the spines and conditional discharges as if they were uh, homogeneous type of sentences. But we know that you know they're incredibly heterogeneous, right? So we said, okay, so how can we uh, account for that uncertainty that we're not accounting for? And, and we came up. Yeah, and we came up with this idea that this would be very similar to what is known as a Bergson measurement error type of model. So basically, we've got this is our observed uh, value of severity. This is the true value of severity, really, that we're after that we should have. But basically, the true value has got more variability than the observed one because the observed one is just an estimate. So we are actually going to change and have this kind of measurement error model where we are actually include the variability. And that extra variability comes to us, and we decided to use just the normal distributions that we were using, you know, to actually uh, estimate, you know, the severity scores in the first place. So we can do all these two things um, because Bayesian, the Bayesian framework is super flexible. So you can throw measurement error models, missing data models, you know, and and, and estimate everything at the same time and let it, you know, run and see how it propagates. So that's what we did. And now we estimated the whole thing again, but now using Bayesian stats. So, you know, there are no p-values, no standard errors. This would be similar to the standard errors. These are the standard deviations for those point estimates. So it's actually the same thing, really, at the end of the day. It's just, you know, some basic statisticians are very picky about that. Uh, okay, so this is the model that we had before with all the different sentences, now using a uh, Bayesian framework. And now this is the model that we obtained after accounting for uncertainty. Uh, measurement error model, heterogeneity uh, within different types of sentences and, and sampling error. And actually, Although we are changing this, and it's a bit more of an issue, uh, you know, as, what we see is that the standard errors uh, have widened now, you know, a little bit larger, as we expected, but not massively so. So in a way, this is more realistic, but it doesn't, you know, it's, it's not so much of an issue. Still, it's important, especially with making some more changes and allowing for more uncertainty. And actually, we see that they're widening a little bit more. The point is that if we if we don't do that, you know, there's going to be a higher chance of committing type one errors. So like, you know, uh, as certain as Establishing that there is a particular effect when nothing was there. So this is not just more realistic; it improves, right? The estimation. Okay. Um, now some final touches. So I'm gonna keep changing the scale, scale of severity, so you will hear from me a little bit more. Uh, so that's what we're doing at the moment. So we assume that there was a linear extrapolation for uh, the custodial sentences after three months. You must just carry on. Um, now we start asking magistrates and, and different criminal law experts whether that's the case, uh, because. What we see in the literature is that some people point at diminishing returns of severity for every year in prison. Um, so I think you can see this uh, with an example. So basically, the point of this is that like if you get 10 days in prison, opposed to 11 days, it might make a difference, a little bit of a difference. If you get 1,000 days as opposed to 1,001, that doesn't matter, right? So every additional day will give you more severity, but less so than the previous one, right? So when we ask judges, uh, magistrates, they actually told us true. Right? Every time you multiply by four the duration, you multiply by four energy, but also by 90% of that. Um, now, you know, talking to some theme of theory, they're saying, okay, but this is not uniform. Uh, you know, there's different milestones. You know, at one point, you know, like prisoners will, uh, you know, will lose their wives, so, you know, we lose their job, right? So, you know, you've got to identify. Okay, so that's something that we look into. 
so far, you know, we're getting you know step by step, you know, getting it approximating as much as possible. And now the other the change, and this only took place last week, but I think is that one of the most important breakthroughs of the project um, is that we actually changed the format. So we were using self-completed questionnaires before, um, but we realized that you know it was a very difficult question and. Many people could come from different angles and see the question differently. So one of the core eyes is an expert in expert elicitation techniques. So we decided to use this kind of workshop. So this is the idea. Expert elicitation techniques is the idea that you turn subjective views into statistical distributions. Like what, what is the probability of a hard Brexit, for example? So you could you could <coughs> give me different different probabilities, but we also care about the uncertainty about your views, right? And how do we elicit that those views are subjective? And so that's the idea of, of, of what we did there. Um, we found you know really interesting findings. So first of all, you know we only did with six participants because more than that, you know, doesn't really work. Um, but a very heterogeneous group. So we had an academic, a penal theorist, two criminal law experts from the Sentencing Council, uh, one magistrate, someone from um, uh, a criminal expert from the Criminal Law Society Association, and some uh, a criminal expert from the Law Commission. And um, a sort of a, of a similar um, questionnaire. Only now we've got rather than just fines, we've got fines A, B, C, D, E, F. And then community orders, we break them down by low, medium, and high. So we've got a little bit more of uh, information there. Mm -hmm. But the main thing is that we changed the format. Rather than you know, trying to speed it up as fast as possible to avoid interview fatigue, we actually turned it completely around. And we made it in, on purpose as uh, anguishing, you know, and as you know, like really time consuming, as, as difficult, really, you know, not difficult, but you, we asked for you know, like considerations as thorough as they could give us. So we spent pretty much the whole day with them. And everyone ended up drained, really. But by doing that, we realized, you know, like how the responses were being much more valid. And the way we saw that is is because we saw that many of them were coming from different angles. So you know, some of them were touching upon different elements that some of them were forgetting uh, or not hearing. And they, you know, they were, were giving us different responses. But as soon as they, we allowed them to speak and explain where they were coming from uh, from that angle. Very quickly, they reach consensus without us, you know, without you know ha us having to force it or you know impose it on them really. So we could see, you know, like how those responses were a lot more valid. But again, and that's already useful. And the fact that we've got now more sentence outcomes is already useful. Those two things will make it worthwhile on its own. But the most important thing really is that we were able now to start asking them about you know like distributions that we were assuming this latent distribution. So. And we did that through warming them up because it's a difficult question, right? I mean, so we asked them many different questions to start thinking in distribution terms and ranges because for most of them, they didn't know what a statistical distribution is really. I mean, they hadn't thought about it before. So by doing that, we actually got from them that fines are about, you know, a lot more concentrated in severity than community orders. So about, you know, one quarter roughly, you know, so definitely the assumption that it's equal variance, you know, is, 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 doesn't hold at all. Uh, so we're changing now that, and but also you know at the same time suspend the sentences you know can have like a much more like variability of severity or range of severity because you know if they get executed then then right I mean that's pretty bad if they don't that's almost nothing right so you know they were saying about twice as as encompassing now that's super important because that's gonna change how that look like right I mean that our distributions completely. That's going to define, uh, it's going to change our severity scores, importantly. Um, so we are now including that, but also I think that has got implications beyond this particular project. So we try to turn this into a methodical paper um, because all these scales that use this method for crime seriousness, you know, it's been massively used in health economics, you know, to choose policy, like would you prefer, you know, longer life expectancy, better quality of life, and stuff like that. None of them care, you know, consider these assumptions. And that's what is driving the whole thing in the end. So, you know, we're really excited about that. And hopefully, you know, um, quantitative, you know, methodical paper will come from that. This is kind of like the matrix that we've obtained. I was going to talk a little bit about that, but I don't think it's important. So, let's just wrap it up. So, uh, what we try to do is see whether, you know, people in the sentencing council as well would like to do something similar. Um, also, we are going to try to start looking into proportionality. So, like cardinal and ordinal proportionality, start plotting, you know, now we've got a scale of sentence severity. There are hundreds of scales of crime seriousness. Let's plot them all and see, you know, how one follows each other, right? And we will expect if the system is proportional to be the case, for that to be the case, if there is penal populism following the London riots, for example, we will expect to see, you know, diverge, divergence there. So basically, it is possible to look at these things from a positive, positivist uh, point of view. So it's not entirely a normative debate. That's, that's our point. That's what we want to actually do in that paper. 
And then just to conclude, you know, like, um, so very quickly, you know, so the main points, you know, the main takeaway points. So selection bias, we demonstrated as extremely pervasive, and we need to do something about it. And we, and the methods that are out there at the moment, you know, are just not good enough, really. Um, yeah, methods that are out there are not good enough, uh, and waste information. So we've shown how estimating a scale severity can help us do that. We've shown how you know we can actually show some uh, provide some insights into the effect of the sentencing guidelines. We can see how you know maybe there is discrimination against men, uh, or you know definitely you know there are different uh, coefficients, different values for different coefficients. We've also shown that using Bayesian statistics, we can actually be more realistic about this estimate. So uh, you know do a better job about that. But then ultimately, you know this is all building castles in, in the clouds, how do you say, you know, something that is, is just difficult, right? I mean, so it's such a difficult subjective, subjective com, uh, concept that is much more work is needed. And we actually, you know, we would encourage any researchers, so you guys, anyone that is interested in trying a different method, because that's the way forward, really. I mean, our method is not going to be the best one, and it's going to be flow. If we can start creating scales of severity and comparing them, you know, we can start getting to say something about the phase validity and the different assumptions that came into place. And also, ultimately, and this is my master plan, I hate academics that think, you know, give names to scales. Like this, I don't know if you can across the Cambridge uh, Harm Index. Uh, you know, like, you know, there's uh, there many like those, really, where they actually put a name and they defend, you know, their scale as is the best scale ever. And of course, all the scales are flawed, really. They don't acknowledge that. So my master plan would be to actually put them all together, you know, run some factor analysis and, you know, you know go with an aggregated version of all of them because they will all be flawed. At least, you know, we can actually get to see the signal and take away a little bit of the noise by doing that. Uh, but that will be for the future. All right, thanks a lot. I think that I took too long, but no, anyway, really good. Cool. thank you. That's it. Yeah. Um, feel free to hand if you need to, but if anybody has any questions, we are happy just to come on for it. Would you? I've got two questions, actually. Um, so regarding this study, you mentioned yeah. that you surveyed magistrates and yeah. judges. I was just wondering, has anyone done something similar with members of the public who aren't yeah. legal because obviously we're looking at it from a point of view that we're going to sentence people and see how we change but they're already affected by guidelines and frameworks in place yeah and if we want to deter people from mm -hmm. committing crimes we want the sentences to have an effect on people in society you know absolutely okay so absolutely uh, totally agree with you and yes it's been done in the literature mm -hmm. in the US only um, for exactly the same reason. The reason why we went for sentences was because we wanted to use this to get into their heads right? yeah. and look at issues like consistency, proportionality, but mm -hmm. absolutely, if you want to look at deterrence and those kind of issues, that is, is pointless, really, you've got to be looking so the authority. Yeah. Oh, so there have been studies that have done that? Yeah, there has been bad, you know, ages, really. So oh, nothing, nice. you know, nothing that can be used at the moment, really. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. Have you, have you or American studies, ever uh, tested kind of the offender perspective of selection? Defendant perspective? Defender. Offender, yes, uh, there, there are also a few. Now, uh, we've got more of an issue with that. You know, we also consider you know, that as a possibility. The issue uh, with doing that is is that it seems that, you know, they are very biased regarding, you know, biased in the way, or they are very knowledgeable regarding about the specific uh, punishment that they receive, but they're not so knowledgeable about all the different that they could have had. So that's, Maybe more interesting per se, you know, as a substantive question than you know to create, you know, like as a tool to create, you know, a scale that is uh, generalizable. But yeah, there are studies out there. So I, I look into, I don't know that off the top of my head, but I remember some of those American studies have look at different samples, like police officers, offenders, yeah, members of the general public, and compare. Mm -hmm. and, and results definitely vary by a lot. So that's something you have to take into consideration. Yeah. And that's my second question. Sorry. Um, I remembered, uh, Amber, that you mentioned transcripts from judges' sentencing remarks. I was just wondering, how are we using them at the moment and how frequent is that data? So we have them for every case at the Crown Court, or we, we could get them for every case at the Crown Court, but we have to pay for them to be transcribed. So they cost about, well, they don't know, about 20 to 40 pounds on average per transcript, but it depends. It's per word or kind of per paragraph almost. So sometimes it can be hundreds of pounds and sometimes they're four or five pounds. So we tend to get a sample of them and um, for that sample to be as uh, representative as possible of the range of sentences. So it's just like randomly one year at a time. Uh, yeah, so say we were, uh, when we were developing our manslaughter guide and we got all of the transcripts for a particular year, uh, for some offences that are really high volume, we might get um, 30, 40, 50, 60 offences, uh, transcripts for that particular offence, just to give our policy leads 
of an, an idea or a flavour of the sorts of factors that take into account and the sorts of sentences that people get for that offence. And then for our evaluations, we tend to do the same sort of thing. We might um, get a sample of transcripts after yeah. the guidelines in force and then compare and kind of see, oh, it looks like psychological harm is being taken into account more now than it was before the guidelines in force, or weapons have become more or less influential. And are we tax mining those? We are not at the moment because it sounds like some studies were done previously that looked into whether that's possible and mm. because sentences uh, don't know that that's one way of using that and they have to give out their um, sentencing remarks in court they know that they need to say things like this was a really serious offence and they're saying that because mm. the the offender and the victims and the witnesses are there not because it was a serious version of that offence okay. or they might say uh, they might say that they took something into account oh it's kind of like more about the wording I think I'm not exactly sure what what, what it was about it, it sounded like um some people looked into it a while ago and that it wasn't very reliable. But you know some people who have, and you've looked into this. Yeah, so they, it is a, they something similar. It's not like the whole transcript, but you know, they, so they just said out there for the law pages that get up. Yeah, pages. The, the law pages. Oh, yeah, it's a private. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's, yeah, um, it's, it breaches anonymity, you know, by the, by the same amount. It's basically, you know, like uh, access from, you know, different mm. cases. And, and they, you can get a little bit of information about you know the nuances or the characteristics of the case. So we've kind of like data mined the data set, so capture it and then scan it using a little bit of text mining techniques. So then the 18th of this month, there's going to be a paper coming out and hopefully you know on, on press as well because we've got the Oxford and Leeds University press teams behind it. And it's actually going to talk about the Minister of Justice because uh, what we're doing in that paper is actually looking at discrimination and looking at, we do that by getting the discrimination against Muslim people, uh, offenders, and we do get whether they're Muslims or not based on the name on their name. So it's a rough, you know, way to establish it. And we find that there isn't, actually. Um, but uh, some of the people, like Carly Lightoller from the University of Liverpool, it's just insane, they said, now to look into intoxication and how judges talk about intoxication in some cases they're using, you know, in a very paternalistic way, you shouldn't be drunk, you know, when your mini skirt and stuff like that, you've got to come in. And in some of the cases, it's more like a large kind of thing. So she's looking into all of that from a more qualitative view in that data, like the law pages data. What we find, though, is that that is uh, the information on the law pages. It's not for every case, and it tends to be for the more serious offences. And this is where, uh, like, a defence solicitor can upload the remarks themselves. Okay. I think it seems to be partly about getting their names on the website, so you can see, like, who defended the offender. So, so we're not quite mm. sure about the representativeness of how, mm -hmm. how it gets decided. Um, and sometimes they seem to be summarised and we're not sure yet. We've not really had a chance well, yet to look yeah, into yeah, kind of yeah. how, how much isn't included. So sometimes yeah. it might just be two or three lines um, of a summary of the offence, which is more useful than nothing, yeah. but um, not as useful as the transcript. So we're going to try and do a comparison for something where we have a lot of transcripts and compare the two and see what's yeah. similar and what's yeah. really helpful. Just, just, just so you know, the um, data science team uh, are able to just plow uh, audio recording straight into a, a voice to text converter to then plow into data mining. So without right. actually having to do the transcription bit, which is expensive. There's, right. There are some little gadgets out there to, that could effectively pipe all of that through. That would be really handy to get there, there, Yeah, there is, there is no reason to not be using every single case in the, in the ground court of sensing the box, in theory, because right. like, I, I hate the fact that we have to pay for Pay for a transcript. You know, I hate that. Um, I sort of pay for someone in there just recording the. Uh, uh, I don't know what I'm up to. Um, but you know, Jimmy, sort of, I think it, that might be a way of just. Oh, yeah, anyway, we can save money. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, the last time we looked into it, it seemed like it was the only option at the time. Yeah, no, which, 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 which makes sense. I've I, I just got an observation regarding. Um, so we'll be doing a lot of work on short custodial sentences. So I, I imagine most of your, the data comes from the Crown space. In terms of the spec, you know, in terms of this, the most of the error in that right. in that spectrum, but, but what was quite interesting, we looked at um, individual sentencing episodes based on the number of times offenders were being sentenced. So we wanted to see if you were sentenced to a fine, what were your previous sentences? If you were sentenced mm -hmm. to community order, mm -hmm. you were sentences in the same short custody, and we found that the system works as one would expect that you start off with a fine and then you progress up right. the severity scale. So I, I do wonder whether there's an element of we need to look at this from the point of view of, of repeat offenders and pro the prolific offender group to see if there's an effect from right. 
offending history driving up yeah. aggregate levels of severity versus individuals. So like, I imagine that the most severe offences in the Crown Court are probably one off with probably less of a complex history. I could be wrong, no, I wasn't that um, thinking quickly. Whereas those that might be a, if you want to cycle, you know, a churn element yeah. going to, you might have two different dis discrete populations, just a, a thought. But. Yeah, that might be driving you know the increasing severity. I don't yeah. know that. I mean, it's you know we, that's, we finished that paper saying that you know that's the next question that you know we need to look into. Um, no, we people are jumping. Yeah. We're using the CPD data to look at things over time, the court proceedings database, yes. and that doesn't have yeah. previous convictions. We have our data collections, which have previous convictions, but we don't have that continuously over time. Yeah. I guess the PNC would be the thing that. And, 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 that, that, and that's where we've been getting our data from is from the PNC. So obviously there's, there's a complexity in like right. access to data and all that type of thing, but. It's sort of just interesting that the, there might be different ways of looking at it depending on because yeah. our prolific offenders obviously we're very concerned about from a policy perspective because they're incredibly hard to reach when you look at your intervention. There are some other areas that I think are interesting from a policy perspective. Um, Gabriel may groan at this point, but it's like home detention curfew and the natural release point from prison um, because you might you your sentence in days is one thing, but how many days you actually spend in prison is a different kind of thing. And it's not a straightforward formula, mm. particularly as we're trying as we're yeah. trying to encourage more people to be out on HGC than earlier. So there's an element of that which I think could be quite interesting. And also the, another thing on suspended sentence. My understanding is the decision should be I sentence you to X years in prison. Mm. I then suspend the sentence. Yeah. Now, do we do we actually know what one would have got before it was then suspended? Does that make sense? You know? so, it, so they should that should be recorded yeah. um, in the court proceedings database. It is recorded, but it's not generally used or trusted, or it's not published. Yes, but it is available. Because of the reason what what, what I what I quite like with the severity score is it, it's actually the difference. To me, I would call the difference between what you would have got and what the like perceptions maybe and the requirements of the suspended orders mm. is, a, is a measure of not of severity but of the benefit that an offender has received in that sentence uh, wrong word i'm sure there's a better word to use but but there's another but that if we could understand that difference by the reason for the suspension that would be well, quite yeah. informative yeah. in terms of I, I don't i don't know whether we i don't know whether the judges stated the reason for the suspension suspension and I don't know if there are rules for well, we could look what? at the, the data collection data that we have would have if something was suspended and we collect all the other factors that are from the guidelines at least so things like um whether the person had care and responsibilities age yeah, and that yeah, kind of thing. So yeah. you might find a strong association but, yeah, if, if you model the probability of suspension you could probably look into that. So yeah, it might be possible. Because I, I just think that'd be interesting, a different way of looking at the yeah. at the because it's the like we're talking this is a very complex decision making, isn't it? And I'm just curious to know how how consistent that decision making is, which is that's a different stage and it's this bit later on from natural sentence, isn't it? Yeah, no, interesting. Yeah, no, sorry, I can easily get me. No, 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 but I more research questions. That's, that's, that's fine. I, I think that's questions. the biggest question. The difference between you know, the, where the, the overlap is, is at, at, at its, uh, you know, it's more visible. Mm -hmm. So, and um, any information that we can throw in there, you know, to actually inform the values, you know, will be yeah, will only improve it. Yeah. Uh, and then just another thing that I observed, which is a challenge that we have generally, is the the, the number of community orders going down. Yeah, and. Your, your point about the severity and how does one convert a, a reduction in severity, well, that actually might mean a different type of disposal. Mm. That's a very interesting question. I wonder if the system, if, if, you know, how, 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 do, how, how do you help people decide that by giving a discount, she then actually would be in a safer space to give a, a severe version of a community order with lots of requirements associated with it and what overlap there is and whether we can help so does that make sense mm -hmm. and, and whether that actually that that overlap in space whether we should be exploring that quite heavily because that might be part of it it's easier to reduce a prison sentence by 25 percent in days well that might be just yeah. a, a default type of activity yeah. whereas the area of mm -hmm. actually would it be better mm -hmm. to give but what we know about the effectiveness of 
uh, community orders versus short custody, it, that would be a very interesting space to explore. So that's a subset, probably. Just lo a long list of questions. Yeah, no, sorry, I've got a long list of questions. So, I'll, 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 yeah, it's so it's got a so, so no, no, no answer, but it's just like uh, lots of things that just from this make me think there's a lot more that we need yeah. to to do to help both from a policy development perspective, but also, but also from an operational delivery perspective mm -hmm. of of empowering judges to make the decisions over the equivalency of particular sentences. Because yeah. I don't know, yeah. I, I, honestly, I have no idea what we give them in advance to help them help you know that. So no, but so. Our, our one policy leader has just left, um, which is a shame, but uh, this is uh, the last one we could explore, I think. Yes, I think there's a lot, a lot that could be done, so yeah. The more you talk about these things, the more things you think of. That we, oh, yeah, 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 indeed, absolutely. Yeah, I, we I, always I, end up talking about this. Mm -hmm. Now, wouldn't it be interesting to do this? Yeah, 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 yeah. But um, I think maybe we'll leave it there, so Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, Great, thank, thank you guys for coming, and you've yeah, got thanks, our contact details, so uh, yeah. can you open the address? Ah, uh, no, but, uh, no, at least. Uh, no, I don't have your name, any cards, but you know me, right? I mean, so you ask me. I, I, I have your email address. Is it possible to get a copy of your presentation? Yeah, sure, sure. Well, that's that's sure. Yeah, I, I know it's a few people want to see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. 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 Thank you.